Welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we are going to touch on Brady arrhythmias. So let's get started. Now, before we, we actually dive into heart blocks, let's start by talking about sinus bradycardia. This isn't usually pathological, so I want to make that clear first and foremost. Sinus bradycardia is characterized by patients with a heart rate that's below 60 beats per minute, but that is in sinus rhythm, meaning the rhythm is regular, there's a P wave before each QRS, a QRS after each P wave, and they have normal morphology. Finally, the PR interval is normal, meaning it is between 0.12 and 0.2 seconds. So, that's very important to keep in mind. We will get to the importance of this interval in more detail in a moment with heart block, okay? So keep that in mind too. Now, if the patient is asymptomatic, but they have sinus bradycardia, they don't receive any treatment. And this is very important because you are going to encounter a huge number of asymptomatic patients with sinus bradycardia, and these patients do not need treatment. So if you see this sort of scenario on, on, in a vignette, uh, someone comes in with a heart rate of 55, but they're fine, and they say, what's the next step? The next step, if there's no symptoms, is to do nothing, okay? Now, if they are hemodynamically stable, but they have symptoms, then we would check for signs of an MI. So an inferior wall MI could affect the right ventricle. Uh, that could be a potential cause of the symptomatic bradycardia. So you want to rule this out, okay? If there's no MI, and first of all, how do we, how do we approach that? Well, we're going to do the same thing we would do that we talked about in the uh, the lecture with MI, right? We're going to do the ECG. We're going to look for all the signs of ECG. We're going to check troponins and, and, and things like that. Now, if there's no MI, then we want to look for another condition that could be causing the bradycardia. So look for things like hypothyroidism. So check TSH. Look for infections like Lyme. And we can ask them, you know, if they are... Uh, what they've done. Have they traveled to any areas where Lyme is, is problematic? Uh, have they traveled? Maybe they have Chagas disease. Uh, and then, of course, the big one is medications. Are they taking things like beta blockers? Are they taking things like opioids, right? Remember, it's always the, typically, it's always the simplest explanation for why something is happening. Now, on the exam, they're not going to test you always on the simplest thing. But in reality, always look at the simplest reasons first. Medications, a huge one. All right. Now, what is the treatment for patients who are hemodynamically unstable? So the first line treatment is going to be atropine. And we're going to give 0.5 milligrams every three to five minutes. And this can be given up to a maximum dose of three milligrams. If the patient doesn't improve with atropine alone, then this is when a temporary pacemaker is going to be placed. Now, really quickly, I want to just uh, review premature ventricular co contractions as it comes up on exam a lot. PVCs are common, and most healthy individuals, like I said in a previous lecture, will occasionally have a premature ventricular beat. And in those individuals who are unlikely to have underlying heart disease, have no symptoms, have less than 500 PVCs per 24 hours, generally don't require any additional testing. Having PVCs is considered self-limiting. It's rarely life-threatening and usually does not require treatment. You will only work up those who have a risk of cardiac disease. And the choice of testing will depend on what cardiac disease the PVCs are associated with. And our testing options vary from ambulatory ECG monitoring and lab studies to echo and exercise stress tests. Now, I mostly just want to show you what a PVC looks like on ECG, again, so you recognize it. But you'll definitely see them in clinical practice because they're very common. Now, there's not a whole lot to be tested, so just recognize what this would look like on an ECG. As, as I said, Google, PVCs, make sure you recognize it, and then move on. All right, so with that out of the way, let's talk now about heart blocks. These are the main focus of this lecture. So let's start with first-degree AV blocks, and this is all a review from step one. Hopefully, you guys remember this stuff. So you will recognize first-degree heart blocks because there will not be an interruption, just a delay in the transmission of an impulse from the atria to the ventricles. Now, this delay is seen on ECG as a prolongation of the PR interval, and any delay that's greater than 0.2 seconds will constitute a first-degree AV block. Now, the delay transmission can occur in a variety of locations, with the most common being the AV node, but the atria or the bundle of His are also possible locations. So if a patient's found to, be, to, to have a first-degree AV block, you should always evaluate for electrolyte abnormalities, for thyroid disease, or for any medications that could be contributing. Medications that you really want to keep in mind here are medications that can alter AV node conduction. So beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, digoxin. Also, if they are in an in, in endemic area, please keep Lyme disease in mind because that could be a cause as well. Now, there's also an association with first degree AV block and several cardiomyopathies, including the infiltrative and dilated types of cardiomyopathy. All right, here is an ECG of a first degree AV block. So 
Here we have a delay that's greater than 0.2 seconds in the PR interval that, as I mentioned, constitutes a first degree AV block. You can see that in this portion of the strip here, there's always a P wave before the QRS complex, and there is a QRS complex after each P wave. So the PR interval is really the only abnormality that we're looking at here. So if you, if you aren't familiar with this and you look at this, you might think nothing of it. But now that you are familiar with the first degree AV block, that's what you're looking for. Now let's talk about second degree AV blocks. We have Mobitz type 1 and we have Mobitz type 2. Now in Mobitz 1, the PR interval progressively gets longer and longer and longer until a non-conducted P wave occurs. Then it is followed by a shorter PR interval compared to the last P wave before the block, and then this process simply repeats itself. In Mobitz type 2, the PR interval will remain the same before a P wave, but there's failure to conduct to the ventricles. All right, let's dive in a little bit deeper. So a Mobitz type 1, as I mentioned, is a second degree AV block. And this can be seen in younger patients and athletes as well. And the reason why is because of higher vagal tone. Fortunately, these individuals typically don't progress to a more serious form of heart block. So as you should know from your anatomy studies, the right coronary artery supplies blood to the AV node. So it shouldn't be too surprising that a Mobitz type 1 can be a complication of an inferior wall MI. Now, in terms of ECG findings, the RR interval decreases with each conducted P wave of the cycle. And as I mentioned earlier, the main thing that you're likely to notice on ECG is the increasing PR interval until there's a non-conducted P wave, and then the cycle just repeats itself. Now, this cycle is usually uh, consistent and known as uh, grouped beating, with the pattern occurring commonly with ratios of 3 to 2, 4 to 3, or 5 to 4. All right, there's some maneuvers that are going to be used and that are characteristically associated with Mobitz type 1 second degree AV block. Uh, a little later on the lecture, we'll get to a 2 to 1 AV block, and you'll see these maneuvers will be useful for tackling difficulties when you're trying to identify Mobitz type 1 or 2. But let's talk about some of these um, maneuvers. So Mobitz type 1 is worsened by carotid massage because of the increase in vagal tone. This results in slowing of impulse conduction through the AV node. Now, worsening here is defined as the change to a higher grade block after implementing carotid massage. Atropine will improve a Mobitz type 1 uh, se uh, second degree AV block because it improves AV nodal conduction. And this improvement is visualized with less frequently non conducted P waves. So remember that for Mobitz type 1, the block is usually in the AV node. There is a low risk of progression to a more serious block. Carotid massages will worsen the block. Atropine improve the block. Again, this condition is defined, remember, as having an increasing PR interval with each conducted P wave of the cycle till the P wave fails to conduct and the group beating repeats. Oftentimes, there really is no need for treatment in this scenario. It's sort of a, you know, examine the patient. If they're symptomatic, we can treat, but oftentimes you don't need anything. Now, if you're dealing with an unstable patient, um, the first step will be to implement atropine. And if they're still unstable at that point, we move to uh, transvenous pacing. And if they have a low blood pressure, we give uh, dopamine. And if they have heart failure, we give dobutamine. Now, once they're stable, then we look for the reversible cause. And if you can reverse the cause and the heart block resolves, then there's really no need for a pacemaker. Otherwise, if it's not reversible and the patient remains symptomatic, then we would implement personal, uh, a permanent pacemaker. Now, like I said, this whole sequence will rarely be followed for Mobitz type 1. Usually patients are asymptomatic and require no further treatment, but just in case they do, just in case they throw something at you on the exam, uh, this is sort of the approach that you want to take. Now, whereas Mobitz type 1 is usually a block at the level of the AV node, remember, Mobitz type 2 occurs below the level of the AV node. The PR interval here will be constant, and then a P wave will simply fail to conduct to the ventricles. Now, the same associations are seen in Mobitz type 2 as type 1. And the symptoms include fatigue, dyspnea, chest pain, presyncope or syncope, as well, in this case, as sudden cardiac death. And that's in contrast to Mobitz type 1, where, where remember I said patients are typically going to be asymptomatic. So I want you to remember that there are big differences in how a patient with Mobitz type 1 and type 2 will respond to maneuvers. So exercise in atropine would worsen Mobitz type 2, whereas carotid sinus massage improves Mobitz type 2. And remember, carotid massage worsens type 1. This is because the vagal maneuvers here slow the sinus rate. They allow more time for excitability to recover at the block below the AV node, and that improves the Mobitz type 2. When it comes to treatment, here is where there's a big difference. Stable patients who have Mobitz type 1 require no further intervention. Stable patients with Mobitz type 2 
will have uh, the placement of transcutaneous pacing pads. And then we will explore for a reversible cause and fix it if we can. If we can't identify any uh, reversible cause and treat it, then we will implement a permanent pacemaker. Unstable patients with Mobitz type 2 will get an escalating sequence of atropine. And then if they're still unstable based on that, then transcutaneous pacing. If their blood pressure is low, we will give IV dopamine. If heart failure is present, we can give IV dobutamine and then transvenous pacing. And then once they're stable, we want to look for the reversible cause if possible. If, 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 and if found, treat it. Now, if there's no reversible cause identified, then of course, permanent pacemaker placing will be necessary. So you can see the treatment is very different for types 1 and type 2. If you can't find a reversible cause and treat it to resolve Mobitz type 2, then we put in a pacemaker. Whereas only unstable patients with type 1 uh, who, ha who, who don't have a reversible underlying cause would need the pacemaker. All right, so not too challenging, but something important to keep in mind. Now, if we have a 2 to 1 AV block on ECG, there's going to be some difficulty in knowing if we're dealing with a Mobitz type 1 or a Mobitz type 2. And this makes sense because the cycle is so short, you can't see either the elongate, elongating PR interval before a drop in Mobitz type 1 or the P wave failing to conduct to the ventricles in Mobitz type 2. So some ways that we can, uh, some things we can do to help differentiate include a PR interval greater than 0.3 seconds or if the QRS complex is narrow, then we're most, dealing, most likely dealing with a Mobitz type 1. If atropine results in less frequent non-conducted P waves, this means the block is definitely Mobitz type 2. Now, lack of response to atropine means the block is most likely Mobitz type 2, but it's not necessarily diagnostic. A carotid sinus massage that results in a higher grade block indicates Mobitz type 1, but it's not diagnostic. And conversely, like we went over earlier, improvement with, car with carotid massage is consistent with Mobitz type 2. Okay, so just some important things to keep in mind in case they give this to you on an exam. All right, so let's take a look at a couple ECGs. The first one here is Mobitz type 1. You can see the PR interval is progressively getting longer and longer until a non-conducted P wave occurs. This is then followed by a shorter PR interval compared to the last P wave before the block, and then this process simply repeats. Then we have Mobitz type 2. Here you see PR intervals remain the same before a P wave occurs, which simply fails to conduct to the ventricles. Okay, so you can see that very easily on uh, about three quarters of the way through, you'll see that lack of conduction. And then finally, a two to one block. Now, as you can see, this is difficult to distinguish between uh, Mobitz type one and two. So that's at that point, a, a maneuver like the carotid massage or atropine can help us to differentiate. Remember, carotid massage would worsen a Mobitz type one or improve a Mobitz type two. All right, and finally, we have the third degree heart block. Now, like with all heart blocks, you always wanna check for electrolyte abnormalities as well as TSH levels. Now, this one has the same disease associations as the other types with the addition of maternal lupus as a potential congenital cause of a third degree AV block. So the third degree AV block's main feature is that it's associated with a complete failure of impulse conduction between the atria and the ventricles. And this means that P waves have no relation to QRX complexes. And the symptoms are the same as those potentially seen in Mobus type two, but while those second degree patients may be asymptomatic, third degree AV block patients are almost always symptomatic. So these patients are at a very high risk for ventricular arrhythmias or asystole, and immediate treatment must be initiated. So you should recognize this sequence of events that I'm about to give you. So for the treatment of unstable patients, we give atropine. If they're still unstable, then start transcutaneous pacing. If the patient continues to have low BP, we give IV dopamine. Or if they're in heart failure, we give IV dobutamine, right? Same strategy as before. Next, you will initiate transvenous pacing, and then once stable, we want to look for that reversible cause. If no reversible cause can be identified, we will place a permanent pacemaker. Stable patients should have transcutaneous pacing pads placed while we uh, explore any reversible cause. Okay. Now, if it's not reversible, of course, we go to the permanent pacemaker. Okay, here's an ECG. Hopefully, you can see this. Uh, demonstrating a third degree AV block. And as you can see, the P wave has no relation to the QRS complexes. I would Google this so that you're familiar with what this looks like. All right, let's do a couple content review questions. I'll give you 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time though, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back.
Correct answer here is D. Next question. I will give you 20 seconds on the clock, but if you need more time, go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is B. And our final content review question, I'll give you 20 seconds. If you need a little more time, hit the pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is B. All right, that is the end of this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one.